So we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Christine O'Hara. I am a board member and past president of the California Garden and Landscape History Society. And I also served on the same board as our two speakers, the National Asso Association for Olmstead Parks. CJLHS is a membership-led organization, and your membership and event fees help provide programming like this one today. We welcome professionals working in the fields of landscape architecture and cultural resources, designers and gardeners, and anyone simply interested in the history of our state. Members benefit from early registration and discounted rates to our programming, including our annual conference. Members also receive quarterly editions of our journal, Eden. If you'd like to know more, please see our website at cglhs.org. This lecture is being recorded and will last approximately one hour with a few minutes at the end for questions. Please type your questions into the chat at any time. We ask at this time that you turn off your video during the presentation. I'm pleased to welcome our speakers. Ralph Diamant, Rolf Diamant, sorry, is a landscape architect adjunct associate professor of historic preservation at the University of Vermont and former superintendent of five national parks, including the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site. He regularly contributes to the journal Park Stewards Forum and is co-editor and contributing editor of A Thinking Person's Guide to America's National Parks. Ethan Carr, a fellow of ASLA, is a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is an international authority on America's public landscapes. He is author of Wilderness by Design, Landscape Architecture in the National Park Service, Mission 66, Modernism and the National Park Dilemma, and The Greatest Beach, A History of Cape Cod National Seashore. He is also lead editor of Public Nature, Scenery, History, and Park Design, and lastly, co-editor of Volume 8 of the Papers of Frederick Law Olmsted. And with that introduction of our esteemed speakers, I will hand this over to them and we'll get started. Thank you, Christy. Um, I'll begin, this is Ethan Carr and uh, Rolf and I are so pleased to be here and pleased to be talking to a group of California landscape historians. Uh, we've been all over the place, virtually, uh, mostly, uh, talking about this book and talking about uh, what, what the book is about. Um, but I think this will be a particularly knowledgeable group. So we're looking forward to having some discussion and we will try to keep it brief so that we have time for some discussion. Um, uh, the, the book is really about Amer what sometimes gets called America's best idea, a phrase that neither of us are very fond of, I think, uh, but it's about the national park idea, which in, for us is in 1864, when Congress makes the Yosemite grant, Congress acts to create a public park. Uh, and it's really the beginning of the national park system. If you feel that it's more properly should be Yellowstone in 1872, we're happy to discuss that as well. There are many things uh, that we potentially can discuss about the origins of national parks. But our purpose was really to contextualize this 1864 act in the turbulent years before, during, and after the Civil War and all of the great uh, enormous changes that the American Republic was going through uh, and really understanding how national parks came out of that uh, turmoil. Um, and, and by contextualize, I think what we really mean is looking at the national park idea as part of the broader park movement in the United States. In other words, it's, it's the park idea, not just the national park idea. And so we do talk about Central Park in particular, 1858 in New York, uh, and we do talk about Frederick Law instead because he is a key figure that runs through all of these disparate themes, movements, all the turbulence of these years. And it's, the book isn't really about Frederick Law instead, but it uses him as the thread that connects many different trends, many different movements, ideas uh, that are coming together in the idea that public parks should be an important institution of the remade republic during and following um, um, the years of the Civil War. And so uh, my first comment will be, um, uh, you may or may not think of national parks as America's best idea. I think that's a, 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 probably a fairly silly way to think of it. Um, but if we thought about American parks more generally, the whole idea of parks and park planning, the whole idea of uh, conservation really um, uh, in, in, that, in that sense, 
uh, as being important to us today in ideas like landscape urbanism and sustainability, uh, the whole idea of creating more sustainable patterns of human habitation, both socially and environmentally uh, on the planet today, then maybe we are talking about a pretty good idea, um, whether it's the best idea or, or not. Uh, and the second thing I'll say is, why are we talking about Frederick Olmsted? I think that's a fair question. Um, everyone knows that his plan for Yosemite that he published as the Yosemite Report in 1865 was not implemented, um, and that he left for New York in 1865 to go work on Prospect Park in Brooklyn with Calvert Vox. Um, and so for, for Californians in particular, there's a, a question, um, how, how is he so important at Yosemite? How is he so important with the national park idea in general? when in fact he was only in California for a few years and then and then went back to New York and didn't really have anything important to do with Yosemite um, after that. Um, and so that's th those are questions I hope we'll address uh, between Rolf and myself um, and the book certainly addresses. Um, and we'll begin by talking about origin stories. Um, please work, okay, there we go. Um, and so origin stories are important. Um, uh, and the National Park Service, once it's created in 1916, promoted uh, first the great story of the campfire in Yellowstone, where a group of disinterested people uh, decided that Yellowstone should be a national park. <clears throat> and when that proved to be untrue, <laughs> a fabrication uh, of the early 19th of the early um, uh, 20th century, um, the Park Service moved on to another campfire story. This one at least did take place between John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but the point being that these, I, this idea of the national parks uh, being uh, the origins of the national park coming about um, uh, through these uh, disinterested great conservationists deciding there should be national parks um, was very uh, 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 seductive for the National Park Service and for the American public because they offered a sort of a virgin birth for the idea, America's best idea. Um, and and uh, I don't wanna go on too much about the campfire stories, except to say that obviously we don't feel either of these is a, really a contextualized or fully uh, meaningful uh, way of thinking about the origin of the National Park idea. The Yellowstone one never even happened. Uh, of course, Muir and Roosevelt were great conservationists, can't take anything away from them. Uh, but on the other hand, in 1864, Teddy Roosevelt was a small child and John Muir, if I'm not mistaken, was still working in a factory in Indiana. Uh, I'm sure there are people uh, with us today who can correct me if I'm wrong about the life of John Muir, but neither of these stories really have anything to do with what happens in 1864. Uh, and so what, what does have to do with that? And why are these campfire stories so compelling? They're part of a narrative that the Park Service is creating in the early 20th century uh, 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 for the origins of national parks that relates to the, uh, uh, the, the increased automotive tourism. We see here Muir's original plan of a disparate group of scenic places. And then Stephen Mather, the first director of the Park Service, uh, putting forward his park to park highway. It's all about you know, a connected system, a park system, in other words, where all of these places would be administered according to consistent principles, design details, and so on, and that they would all become connected by improved automotive highways. Remember, Park Service is created in 1916. Federal government starts um, subsidizing state highway systems in 1918. Uh, and so this idea of automotive tourism and a world of pristine Western wilderness that is mostly being accessed by white middle-class um, tourists uh, uh, in automobiles. Um, and so that's really the, the idea of the national parks that the Park Service uh, promoted. Um, and that was an important and remains an important uh, origin story, if you like, if we think of campfire tales uh, uh, as a whole. Um, and of course, we're interested in another way of contextualizing where this idea came from. And to do that, we look back to Central Park in particular um, and, the, and the institution of public parks as they are being created during and after the Civil War, this idea of a great new public institution. And when we think about all the new great public institutions that are being created in the American Republic, as the Republic is being remade through the terrible violence of the Civil War, reconstruction, 
constitutional amendments, Rolf will talk in much more detail about um, this, this context. Um, but just to, to, to note that the institution of the public park uh, is one of the great new institutions of the remade republic, and that it includes urban parks as well as national parks. And Yosemite and Central Park have certain key things um, that they do have in common, as different as they are. One of them is their date. Uh, the Yosemite grant is made while uh, Central Park is still under construction. Another is Frederick Law Olmsted, who happens to be the co-designer of Central Park and happens to be in Bear Valley, um, uh, close by to Yosemite Valley in 1864 when the grant was made, and then is asked to chair the commission uh, uh, for how Yosemite Valley um, should be managed and, and writes the 1865 report, which we reprint in the book and which we argue is the intellectual framework uh, for not just the national park idea, but really for the American park idea uh, as a public institution during the decades following um, the Civil War. Um, this letter from Sarah Shaw that serves as an epigraph, a uh, quotation from it for the book, uh, nicely captures it. Um, Sarah Shaw was someone Olmsted knew, uh, you know, a typical Boston Brahmin reformer, abolitionist uh, activist in many ways. Her son was uh, Robert Gouldshaw who died in South Carolina a couple of years after she wrote this letter to Olmsted um, leading uh, 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 the black troops of 54th Massachusetts. Uh, uh, and so he was a bit of a martyr uh, to the cause. Uh, Sarah Shaw is making this identification in 1861 between this idea of abolition, the creation of the institution of the public park, specifically Central Park, um, uh, remaking government um, uh, uh, to, to, into a new republic uh, that, that will not share the faults that allowed slavery to exist for decades um, before the Civil War. And we just thought this was a wonderful encapsulation of, of uh, exactly what we were talking about. You now the great social issues of the day being identified with the public park landscape as a new institution of the remade Republic. And I'm aware as you all are of how different uh, Yosemite and Central Park are. Um, uh, <laughs> vastly different settings, clearly. Um, but there's also certain things they do have in common that are very important besides the date, besides the person, uh, besides all of that. And one of them would, I, I would suggest is their purpose. Um, they are both set aside as public places, as public landscapes, uh, sp uh, specifically to allow the public, whoever that is, as it was being defined at the time, uh, to have experiences of landscape beauty available to them because such experiences were necessary to individual well-being and happiness and therefore to the functioning of a democratic society. It's very powerful rhetoric, rhetoric that's really best expressed in many ways in the 1865 uh, Yosemite report that Olmsted writes, but it's a general uh, theme for the American park movement that he is giving voice to. And so this idea that they would actually share a common purpose uh, 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 is, is uh, very important for understanding what they might have in common. I'm ha we're happy to talk about that more. Um, but I think Rolf will also talk more about this second idea, which is they share common meanings. They both emerge out of the cauldron of the Civil War, the, of all the turmoil of that time. Uh, they both embody one uh, a new uh, a, a, a new life for American cities, um, uh, and, and on the other hand, uh, uh, Yosemite does a, a, something similar for the American Republic. Uh, this idea that out that out of the war and out of Reconstruction there would be a remade Republic that would preserve the Union. It would assume a better form. Uh, it would be a, a republic without enslaved people. Um, it would be uh, this great institution of the public park that was making these experiences available to everyone and that was symbolizing um, uh, the commitment of this remade republic to the well being of the public. And of course, that's a problematic term. We all know people were dispossessed in both these cases 
to create them. I think Rolf will go into more detail about this as well. Um, uh, and dispossession is a, a, another common theme of, of this new institution of the public park. Whenever parks are created, whenever anything is preserved or set aside in the world of uh, large scale landscapes and going back to the middle ages in Europe for that matter, um, it's always meant that there were certain rights, certain uh, resources that were being set aside from one group which would no longer have access for someone else. And uh, in the middle ages, of course, that would have been a feudal Lord, uh, but what is it in the mid 19th century? It's the public wherever they are. This great public purpose is being asserted. And that didn't include everyone. Uh, we need to understand that, um, uh, but it comes to include a broader and broader range of people. And today we like to think that indeed it does include everyone, or at least that's the goal. Um, but this idea of a reforged national identity coming out of the Civil War, uh, being embodied in a series of institutions, cultural institutions, literary institutions, newspapers, uh, government institutions, um, that the public park is one of those. And that helps explain, I think, why it is such an important uh, feature of uh, American identity to this day. Um, and and it, we should also note that during the war, images like these were direct rebuttal to Southern propaganda. Because of course, Southerners were fond of saying things like your city, people in your cities, especially immigrants, are worse off than the enslaved people on our plantations. And it's an outrageous thing to say, um, uh, but conditions were bad in Northern cities. And, and this was the vision of the American Republic that the North held that would be increasingly industrial, increasingly urbanized. And if there was no answer to that particular piece of propaganda, it was a problem. And, and images like these are a direct rebuttal. It's a bold radical statement about how an, the American Republic democratic self-government can produce places like these, in other words, cities like these, in which people are health, healthy, happy, pursuing happiness. Um, and, and, and that not only is the American city as it is growing in the mid 19th century tenable and, and practic practicable um, it, and healthful, it would, could even be beautiful. Um, and so when Calvert Fox called Central Park the big artwork of the Republic, he was talking about those ideas. And, this, and when the Atlantic Monthly says, uh, uh, this is the best answer we have yet. Uh, uh, to vindicate the theory of self-government. It's about the propaganda and the rhetoric of the Civil War. You know, the Southerners were not believing in the future of the American Republic and the Northern vision of it. Uh, and so this was powerful political rhetoric um, uh, uh, in those days. And, 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 and I'd like to also um, come to the defense of this idea that um, these places were created primarily, or at least one of the primary purposes was for human beings to have experiences of landscape beauty. This, this also goes against when we think of national parks as wilderness reservations in which people are not that important, but, but ecology and other species are, um, it, it is a very anthropocentric value that, that these places would be set aside for people to experience landscape beauty, but it's in a very important value. And I don't think it's elitist or obsolete. Um, what Olmsted is talking about in the 1865 report, why these places need to be available to the public and not just the wealthy few, and he's very explicit about that. If you don't create public parks, these places will be dominated by the very wealthy, what we would call the 1%. And, they will not be available uh, to the public at large, the body of the people. And again, that's not everyone, but, but it is certainly more people than the 1%. Um, the reason is these experiences are essential to human well being. And that's not so far off from what we have sort of confirmed through the last 30 years, say, of social science research. When we talk about biophilia, when we talk about uh, 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 nature deficit disorder, when we talk about the general need for people to have experiences of nature, which is a general term that is in its way as flawed as, as the way Olmsted was putting it, but what's being expressed in the 19th century uh, as, as an aesthetic experience is being expressed today through social science as, as biophilia or, 
or other uh, uh, ways in which human beings need to have experiences of the natural world in order to uh, lead fulfilled lives. And so I, I come to the defense of, of this idea uh, a little bit and, and, and suggest that it, again, is very important to us today, although, of course, we're going to use different language to describe it. But when we consider the fact that Olmsted was known in 1864, and Central Park especially was known and had become famous by that point as a public park, we should look at why the governor of California, Governor Lowe, is, is, is looking for someone to give him advice on how to manage Yosemite Valley as a public park because Congress had just granted it to the state where, and it does become a state park for the next coming decades until the early 20th century. Um, uh, the fact that Olmsted is right there is certainly serendipitous, but it's also the fact that Olmsted is the most famous park designer, park planner in the country at that point, and he is known for, for uh, asserting the values of public parks as an institution, why we should have them, uh, why governments should be involved in making them. Uh, et cetera. And so it made perfect sense that he would be appointed uh, uh, the chair of the commission uh, to guide the future of Yosemite Valley. Um, and, and he writes the 1865 report, which contains a lot of the ideas um, that I've been uh, trying to allude to. Um, and in fact, uh, the fact you know, that Olmsted doesn't stay, uh, the fact that the Yosemite report is not implemented doesn't isn't really that important. What's important is the ideas in that report do stay. The ideas in that report are the intellectual framework for the national park system as it eventually comes to, into being, especially in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and that ideas like these that, are, that we have extracted from the Yosemite report for your benefit. Uh, you could extract your own series of bullet points here, um, but ideas like these remain extremely relevant today. Um, and that when we talk about the shortcomings of how these parks were made, how people were dispossessed, the shortcomings of the individuals that may have been involved in the American park movement, um, and certainly they, they had their shortcomings. They swam in the tide of their time that were subject to the prejudices and, 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 and racial ideologies that virtually all America, white Americans were at that time. Um, we can still extract what important ideas are there because they may be important to us now, or they may not be. Um, but I think that's part of the discussion we would like to have as a result of this book, because um, there's, there are some important ideas here, and we shouldn't uh, simply uh, assume that everyone still agrees with them, because in fact, uh, some of these ideas, if people do believe them, uh, are not being reflected in official policy and government actions. Um, and these are high ideals. You know, the, 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 my intent here isn't to suggest that they've all were all realized, but they're very powerful. There's a very powerful ideology and political rhetoric for why governments should make parks. Um, and we have, especially since the 1980s, um, governments have backed off from their responsibilities to provide parks as public health infrastructure because access to these places is necessary for human well-being uh, and therefore governments should make them just the way they make water systems and sewage systems just the way they provide services um, that protect public well-being and allow um, cities and in fact the nation as a whole to function in in ways that will lead to healthful uh, results so I'm happy to come back to this if people want to um, discuss this further. Um, but Rolf, are you ready to go? To give us a little more context um, uh, that the book certainly does as well. Okay, you should be all set. Great. Thank you, Ethan. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, Ethan said I will provide a little context. I think it's kind of important to understand uh, the context of Olmsted at this period of time, this 
the years leading up to the Civil War, uh, his involvement in the war, he was deeply involved. Um, but it's un we need probably, and the book tries to make the case that this country was very different prior to 1861. Uh, first and foremost, it was a government that was largely founded on ways to support slavery. The Fugitive Slave Act was a federal law. And it, it favored a, a weak government, uh, basically a small government, a central government with no taxation, no personal taxation. Of course, if there was taxation, uh, property would be taxed and slaves were considered property and slave people were considered property. And the people who were really behind this didn't certainly wanted to do everything possible to avoid um, that uh, outcome. And as a consequence, uh, funding this small, somewhat anemic central government uh, was, um, uh, even that was a challenge. Uh, and one of the ways they were able to fund the enterprise, the government was through the sale of public land and any proposal to use public land for public purposes. Uh, for education, for parks, for transportation, for homesteading, all of that was a direct threat or viewed at least as a direct threat to the sanctity and continuity and, and even expansion of slavery in America. Now, uh, you know, eventually war comes, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, is elected president in 1860, and it was a free and fair election that was in, a, in, a, in effect nullified by the secession of eventually 13 states um, who refused to recognize the outcome of this election. Uh, this was a moment where there was tremendous confidence in the economic power of cotton to um, uh, preordain the outcome and, uh, and of no fear whatsoever of uh, this attempt to, uh, in effect, um, overthrow the government of the United States. Uh, Olmsted, of course, re-enters this, uh, sees himself as a critical player in this pre period. It certainly seeks uh, a position um, he at the very opening of the war, he, he writes his book Cotton Kingdom, which is based on all the travels he made uh, uh, on behalf of the New York Times as a reporter in the South. Uh, and he issues the Cotton Kingdom of Travelers Observations on Cotton and Slavery in the American Slave States. Um, the, the title of this book is, uh, in fact, a direct uh, parody, if you will, or a play, if you will, on uh, the speech that um, South Carolina Senator James Hammond had given on the floor of the U.S. Senate, where he declared cotton was king. And in fact, uh, the power of cotton would bring the whole world uh, to their knees. Um, Olmsted took a different uh, view of this, obviously, and, and as a, a, an attachment to his Cotton Kingdom book, he included a very interesting map of uh, the American South uh, that was a um, statistical cardiographic view of uh, slavery in the South uh, based on census data, which showed the uh, relative population or concentration of enslaved people in every county of the South. Um, this would be enormously important during the Civil War, uh, and Olmsted understood it intuitively. In, in 1861, he writes an editorial to the New York Times saying that if slavery can be undermined um, in the South, that the Confederacy would be hollowed out and eventually would collapse. And he begins to envision a movement of self-emancipation. Now, he wasn't the only person thinking about this, um, but he was an early thinker about this, that what we consider today the Emancipation Proclamation was, was not issued until 1863, but as early as two years earlier, he's beginning to think that a strategy of self-emancipation, 
that would uh, basically it would become inevitable. Emancipation would become inevitable if so many people resisted slavery. Um, this became a reality um, uh, in the early years of the war, and we won't go into the details, but it became a movement of enslaved people, essentially black resistance against slavery by fleeing uh, their bondage and making their way to union lines. And what started as a trickle became a flood. And uh, certainly by the war's end, there were half a million people who had uh, left uh, uh, bondage for, uh, for the sanctuary of union lines. And, and eventually uh, came, many of them came back uh, as Olmsted also advised, um, came back south as union soldiers as soldiers of the United States Army. And this, uh, as Olmsted predicted, would, uh, would be the death knell of the rebellion, as it was. Now, this had enormous political consequences. Um, not only did it put uh, pressure on the Lincoln administration to legalize emancipation, to codify it uh, in 1863, but also that it provided uh, an opportunity that was clear that there was going to be no return to a pre-war status quo. And with the departure of Southern Democrats from Congress, there was an opportunity to push through all the reforms that had been bottled up in the pre-war years. And so in a matter of months in 1862, literally about three or four months, uh, the country's really turned on its head politically. Um, you know, you have everything from uh, the Department of Agriculture is established, a college land grant act is passed in Congress, um, uh, the Pacific Railroad Act goes through, a Homestead Act, um, and then uh, finally the Second Confiscation Act, and uh, which basically said wherever there are going to be Union troops, people of, uh, who are enslaved are thereby free. Um, uh, from bondage. And the Militia Act uh, also passed, which said that you then can, can be enlisted in the Union Army for any military purpose whatsoever. And ultimately, there's no turning back. The, the, the momentum is built uh, up to the point where uh, at the capstone to this frant frenetic period of acti legislative activity, Lincoln releases his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Now this changes the country profoundly and uh, the image on the left is, I showed this before, this was the pre-war country and in effect, a second American Republic is born after 1862. No longer does it support slavery and in fact uh, has, uh, codified the end of slavery and, and particularly with the 13th Amendment, followed up by the 14th Amendment on citizenship and the 15th Amendment on black suffrage, uh, black male suffrage. Uh, it is an activist government uh, relative to what was there before. Its size, its, its uh, duties and responsibilities have vastly expanded. Uh, the, the taxation system has uh, been invented. There's a national revenue system. And as a result, for the very first time, public lands are set aside for public or civic purposes. And therefore, it's just in this slipstream of activity that uh, one year later, uh, the Yosemite Act, uh, in fact, becomes federal law. And it's another land grant. It's a small one relative to the others, but it's it's still, if you certainly, if you look at what what flowed from it today, it is very consequential, um, and uh, it sets in motion uh, what will be the embryonic uh, uh, foundation of a system of national parks. And as Ethan says, this general movement of parks throughout the United States. Um, Now, in the context of the Yosemite report, a year later, Olmsted makes it very explicit that 
the establishment of government There we go, stay there. The establishment of government uh, 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 of these great public grounds for the free enjoyment of the people is an essential, should be an essential duty of a democracy. And uh, it should be based on principles of equity and benevolence uh, on par with all other duties of Republican government. This is a profoundly important idea that is the, if you will, a philosophical philosophical underpinning of our system of uh, public parks, in particular national parks. Now, as Ethan mentioned, not all people are beneficiaries of this new birth of freedom. For sure, Native American people uh, are excluded. And they're, in fact, forced from uh, not only Yosemite Valley, but uh, traditional homelands from across the country to make way for many of these new land policies. This is a tragedy that has to be acknowledged up front. Um, and you know, the early uh, conservation writers uh, uh, have often, in particularly relative to Yosemite Valley, written a, of it as untrammeled wild nature. And this could be anything but farther from the truth. Uh, they over, willfully overlook countless generations of human occupation. And even Olmsted talks about the wonderful uh, meadows in Yosemite Valley. And of course, those are a result of um, indigenous peoples burning, um, uh, burning the valley floor uh, generation after generation. Now it has to be said that without a union victory that was uh, critically aided by the mobilization of almost 200,000 black soldiers, uh, legislation for Yosemite, which was the template for what happened at Yellowstone seven years later, uh, and the early national parks that then followed might in fact never have happened. Um, uh, there, Black agency uh, was uh, vital to um, the ultimate uh, shape and scope of union victory and, uh, it, and to the success of the second American Republic. Now, just a word about Yellowstone. Yellowstone comes on the slipstream of uh, Yosemite and at a time when the federal government was at, at, a, at an apex of uh, activity in terms of Southern reconstruction, the two cannot be um, separated. Um, in fact, the uh, Yosemite, Yellowstone legislation uh, goes through um, on the tail end of a series of uh, enforcement acts, including uh, an anti Ku Klux Klan legislation just months earlier. Uh, this is Yellowstone is uh, enacted at a time when the national government was prepared to do sorts of things like this enormous park that it had never done before. And I contrast it with uh, the very first time black males were voting in the, uh, across the United States with the passage of the 15th Amendment. Um, now, what happened to this story? It's a good question. Um, by the time a National Park Service is created in 1916, um, this story has been largely erased and Olmsted's involvement in it has been er largely erased as well. This is an era where uh, the promise of this Second American Revolution has not played out for people, uh, people in the South of color. And uh, in fact, uh, it, there's a, a betrayal of this um, promise of, of, of freedom, equity, and benevolence uh, with the collapse of Reconstruction. And it's an era of Jim Crow and the rise of the lost cause narrative. You know, it's, it's the period where there's uh, a great Gettysburg reunion, uh, but only of white soldiers in, a, in 1913. And it's a period of great reconciliation among white people. 
um, the movie Birth of a Nation, uh, which celebrates the, the founding of the Ku Klux Klan, is premiered in the White House and in the halls of Congress. Um, Hollywood loves this romantic view of uh, uh, this false narrative, and you know it continues for years, with all the way up to the movie Gone with the Wind. Um, and the National Park Service, once it's created, um, falls in with uh, these uh, this sort of as as Ethan described this virgin these virgin birth myths. Um, and include, includes uh, segregating its own facilities in the South. Uh, this is a, a photograph on the bottom left of um, Negro area at Lewis Mountain in Shenandoah. This was a segregated campground. And even the Lincoln uh, Monument um, is this great homage to Abraham Lincoln is dedicated with segregated seating in 1922. Um, so this was not a period where it was advantageous for the new National Park Service. They certainly they didn't view it that way to associate uh, the history of national parks with the Civil War and this quest for freedom. Um, in fact, they, they tried to largely forget it or bury it uh, for many, many years. Um, you know, from uh, really from 1916 all the way to 2016, here's a, a coin commemorating the founding of the National Park Service, um, uh, the centennial uh, in 2016. And of course, the Park Service identifies as the fathers of National Park, the National Park Service, John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt. So to conclude, because we want to have plenty of time for questions, we just say that, why is this important today? Well, it's important because we want people to see themselves in the story of the national parks. It's not the exclusive domain of one or two or three great conservationists or um, um, Western explorers. Uh, it's a much more, a complicated story, um, much more, in, it's a much more, uh, it has to be much more inclusive story um, and that people need to see themselves as part of it. Um, Olmsted certainly had a, a role to play, um, but most importantly, he was a chronicler of this great transition in America that set the stage for a renaissance in American parks as a foundational institution of a renewed and revitalized American Republic. And I'll end there and we can hopefully have a few questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph and Ethan. We do have several questions. One is, um, did Olmsted interact with Jesse Fremont? Because um, the question is, California funding for the Sanitary Commission is an interesting part of the book. Uh, I can answer that, Ethan. Uh, yes, you can. Indirectly, uh, she had left, the Fremonts had left California before Olmsted arrived, but the, the intermediary was Thomas Starr King. King was very close to Jesse Benton Fremont, and King is the very first person Olmsted meets with when he arrives in San Francisco. Uh, they both King and Olmsted have been collaborating on sanitary commission business from afar while uh, Olmsted was back east and King was um, a very successful fundraiser for the sanitary commission, critical fundraiser, kept it, kept it from going insolvent, kept it from going bankrupt in the middle of the war, um, uh, kept all his hospitals going. And so uh, uh, Olmsted and King meet a number of times when Olmsted goes out to Mariposa um, and, there was probably little doubt that um, uh, King shares his passion for Yosemite. Um, but I don't, you know, that Olmsted and Jesse Benton Fremont don't, he, Olmsted's not part of her circle of people at Black Point in San Francisco. Um, another associate is uh, Frederick Billings. Um, He's a lawyer in San Francisco. He later also 
uh, very close to King and then very and works with Olmsted. But um, again, Jesse was already east at that point. Another question, uh, Ethan, were you going to add to that? Well, I was just going to point out to Rolf, there's a second part to that question is, which is, have we heard anything from the National Park Service? Um, because I, I, and I do think that that's a, a great question because part of what we're doing is really suggesting to the Park Service that they examine their origin myths and, and examine the degree to which those myths are really important for the identity of the agency, the Park Service today, and more broadly, how people, the public, the ever broadening public, uh, perceive the purposes uh, and meanings of the national parks. And because that has everything to do with who feels ownership of those parks, who feels um, uh, that those parks are there for them and, 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 that, and the, uh, for them to visit, uh, and that the, the experience there would be meaningful for them. Uh, and that's something the Park Service is very concerned with. It was the whole theme of the centennial in 2016, uh, broadening the appeal and the meaning of national parks for, for a broader public. Um, and, and so I think part of what Rolf and I have really determined out of this whole experience is that's a very important goal. Um, and that to do, you really need to address how you are presenting the, the origins of the national parks uh, to the public as part of how you meet that goal, because it has a lot to do with how people perceive the meaning and the purposes of the parks and, and who they belong to, who, 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 who really should be there. Um, and, and right now they're not succeeding. Um, you know, if, if, if some parks have, have very diverse vis visitation, but overall I would say the national park system remains the idea of the, you know, the system of pristine wilderness areas that are accessed mainly by white middle-class tourists and automobiles persists. And, and I think the statistics bear that out. Uh, but it's a pretty profound question, really, um, you know, whether the Park Service, um, how far is the Park Service willing to go to really emb embrace uh, a, a different way of telling the story of their own agency and of the origins and meanings of the national parks? Yeah, I, we, Ethan and I did a webinar for Park Service staff uh, a month or two ago, and I have to say the response was very, very positive, including an, and we had a number of people from Golden Gate uh, uh, on, in the program on, on the webinar who are very interested in to get back to the uh, question, the question about um, Jesse Fremont. We're very interested in that parks part of this story. Good, we have another question is, um, how do you understand Olmsted's relationship to his abandoned plan for San Francisco and the one for Yosemite? Are they connected in his mind? Are they separate? Do they reinforce each other? Oh, that's a very good question. I see Terry Young is out there. Hello, Terry. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and hello to everyone else who I'm not able to greet who I know in this audience. Um, but um, it's a, a great question um, and I haven't really thought about it. Um, uh, it, but I will say this, that the, if you look at the plans for San Francisco and you realize how ready Olmsted is to completely adapt how to design a public park system uh, when you're talking about a, a semi-arid climate or the context of California climate and soils and conditions uh, and so forth, it's really indicative of something that is at the essence of what Olmsted describes as landscape architecture which is understanding the site and responding to the conditions. Um, and in a way, I'll make one observation, Terry, off, off, off the cuff, but if you look at how the park idea is adapted to Yosemite Valley, which is dramatically, right? It's still a park design, but it's a very different park than Central Park, um, while being consistent within the practice that he is developing and describing as landscape architecture, you could look at San Francisco, the San Francisco park system in a similar, similar light, presented with very different conditions, environmentally, uh, soils, climate, et cetera, uh, really coming up with a complete transformation of the idea within the overall practice of what a public park system needs to be for an urban population. Um, and of course, he's, his, greatest, uh, his greatest opponent 
uh, probably in both cases, is public opinion. That you know, because in San Francisco, what do they want? They want Central Park. You know, they, they want a green sward, even though it doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, and 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 um, and at Yosemite Valley, what did they want? They wanted to build all of those hotels and everything else that Olmsted explicitly told them not to do, um, because of public expectations and because. Uh, elected officials would inevitably respond to those expectations as well as their own. But it's a great question. Um, uh, a lot could be done there, I think. Um, Rolf and, and Ethan, in terms of the research that you did, did you find anything about, find out anything about formerly enslaved people or free African-American people's views of Olmsted's creation of public parks? Well, as far as enslaved people or, or formerly enslaved people, freed people, people who were, um, refugees, uh, their circumstances were absolutely desperate. The, the public parks were probably the last thing on their minds. Um, uh, they, you know, survival was fr front and center uh, as most refugees uh, have to deal with. Um, you know, I, this was a period of, uh, of, great, of great difficulty. Uh, if it wasn't survival, it was certainly the, f the struggle for uh, civil rights. And I, you know, I think that was first and foremost in people's minds. You know, I just this very morning, I, I, I uh, live streamed um, the, the rededication of the Shaw uh, 54th monument in, in uh, the Boston Public Garden across from the State House. Uh, it was a very moving um, event, uh, but it was, you know, it was clear to, to build, by the late 19th century, um, the black free community of, of Boston was, were, were in a position to raise a certain amount of money for this monument to the 54th Massachusetts, which was the first uh, official black uh, military unit to fight in the Civil War. Um, but, you know, in the, in the years immediately after uh, the, the Civil War, during the, certainly during the period of Reconstruction, um, uh, I think the attention was on the battle for to uh, hold on to the civil rights they had gained and, and try to uh, make some additional progress. It should be noted also that we're talking about the symbolism of public parks during the Civil War period. They were symbolic of the Union, the American Republic, a Northern vision for the nation's future. Uh, and they never caught on in the South, uh, at least not right away, <laughs> right? Public parks um, uh, were a Northern, Upper Mid Midwestern, Californian phenomenon. They were a Union phenomenon. Um, and of course, most Black Americans were still living in the South. So, so, so they wouldn't have had access uh, to a lot of the public parks that were being created um, in, in, on the northern side of the Mason-Dixon. Um, uh, and and to, I think that's an important point. People, you know, and when pu public parks are created in the South later, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, many of them are segregated. Um, because we're well into the Jim Crow era at that point. So it's a very different story in the American South um, uh, when it comes to public parks. And I'm gonna go ahead and contradict myself for uh, just for a second. Uh, if I may, there, there is a, the, the example of Charleston, uh, South Carolina, where they, they use an old race, an old racetrack is turned into a park, if you will, a memorial park. Um, by the African American community in Charleston, it, it was uh, for the grounds. The racetrack was used, I believe, as a prisoner war camp for Union prisoners, and they turned this into a memorial park um, to commemorate the Union prisoners who died while in captivity. And um, on Emancipation Day every year, for many years during Reconstruction. Uh, African American citizens of Charleston would march to spend the day, would, would, would parade to the park and spend the day there. Um, so this was an important, they, they did, you know, they were recognizing that there were some important spaces for sure. Good. I, I know we're coming up to the one hour point, but we still have more questions. So for the audience, if you do need to get back to work, 
feel free to um, leave the meeting. And for those of you that wanna stay, we'll continue um, with some of the, the rest of these questions. Another one that's somewhat aligned to the, the question that you just answered, you talked about, you know, Olmsted seniors under his, his philosophy about the enslaved people, but how did he feel about the Native Americans being removed from the uh, Yosemite Valley? Did he ever address that in his writing? An important question again. Rolf, I'll let you answer this. Um, Thank you, Ethan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he does this all. And by the way, Rolf, you can contradict yourself all you want. Um, no, just right. don't contradict me, okay? I, 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 <laughs> I, do I contradict myself? I contain multitudes. Um, the uh, no, there's I, I've not not run across it. I, I, you know, it may not be the definitive answer, but uh, I don't. You know, Olmsted writes about Native Americans, uh, but he, you know, in terms of Yosemite, he he writes about it as untrammeled wilderness. His um, his approach is different than John Muir. Uh, Olmsted is certainly more willing. I think it's safe to say, Ethan, to intervene where necessary. He's he wants to, he he takes a he has a very light touch, but he's. He doesn't look at Yosemite Valley as um, uh, untouchable. Um, in fact, uh, later on, he's drawn into a, a controversy uh, about cutting trees in the valley, and he's very careful about uh, ambivalent, yeah, ambivalent about it. There may be times when that's necessary. Muir, of course, is apoplectic about it, and you know is an absolutist on the subject. But neither of them understood why the trees were there, which was of course, once the army had driven the Southern Miwok people away uh, and forcibly taken control, there was no longer, it was, a, it was a cultural landscape that evolved over thousands of years of annual burning. And once that burning was stopped, um, the trees, the lodgepole pines came in, of course. Um, and, and, and so, you know, there was, yeah, there was a huge blind spot for, for understanding Yosemite Valley as a cultural landscape. Which persists today, I might add. Um, you know, the pe people are still confused by the idea. Well, how can Yosemite Valley be a cultural landscape? It's a natural landscape, you know, that kind of thing. But but um, uh, the the controversy over cutting trees in the valley was complicated, and, Olm and Olmsted didn't understand it entirely. Uh, but he knew it was complicated, and he wasn't going to jump on the bandwagon and say, "No, you can never touch a tree in Yosemite Valley," um, because it would if they hadn't. By the way, you know, about fifty percent, I think, is one estimate for how much open space has disappeared in Yosemite Valley because of the uh, of, of succession, poor succession. Um, this is a this would is be, an would interesting... be closer to one hundred percent if 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 people hadn't been out there grubbing up pines and 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 other sort of surreptitious ways of of controlling. Uh, yeah. This ahead, is the interesting moment when uh, Muir and Olmsted collide, more or less. Yeah. You know, it's, they begin to talk, they, they begin to sense each other's presence. Yeah. And Muir is very insecure about uh, Olmsted's reintroduction in, onto the stage here. And when, when is it, Ethan? In 1880s. The, yeah. In the 1880s, you know, the great Olmsted's return and Muir has had a, a Yosemite to himself for a while as the you know the the end all the the, the sage um, and his star is rising at a time where he doesn't want the competition certainly it, not it, from Olmsted he's it, he, it's also true that that was long enough for the lodgepole pines to start growing right, no, uh, right. because it you know, took a couple of decades um, uh, and, and it's also true that Olmsted was traveling a lot to California in the 1880s because of Stanford. Stanford. Um, uh, and, and, and so, and he didn't go back to Yosemite Valley. And, you know, this is another reason people think how he didn't care about Yosemite Valley. He didn't, you know, he didn't have that much to do with Yosemite Valley. I don't think he wanted to go back to Yosemite Valley because he knew what was going on there. He knew what the state administration had done instead of what he told them to do which was build hotels, plow meadows in order to grow crops, plant orchards, and yes, cut trees. Um, by the way, Muir did work as a mill hand in Yosemite Valley, that's how his first job there. But, but and if someone knows more about Muir than I do, please correct me. Um, uh, uh, but but um, it's just very telling. It's, 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 it's not that he didn't care about Yosemite Valley and he didn't write this, so I don't know, yeah. uh, but... but um, it's it's speculation, but also I mean, you know, Ethan's giving uh, 
Olmsted a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. One can also argue that uh, he, he was very busy at Stanford and it was an important commission to him, enormously important commission. And he didn't wanna be drawn into the controversy of Yosemite it, from, a, from a business point of view. Yeah, it, it was a no-win uh, situation, but but uh, but he did write something about um, uh, the use of the axe and government preservation of natural scenery, and and he did address it, but it, it's in a very ambivalent way. He, he he basically ends up saying, you know, it probably probably you need to manage uh, the situation, but it should only be done by experts. Right, <laughs> experts like him, right? You know, <laughs> should only be done by people who are really careful. You shouldn't just have the hotel concessioners out there cutting down trees wherever they're blocking the view, which is what was happening. And and so Olmsted writes this brochure on the axe, use the axe, and uh, Muir writes, "I found Mr. Olmsted's uh, uh, writing a bit dry." Yeah. By the way, it was happening in urban parks as well by the 1880s, because, you know, if they had been planted in the 60s, let's say, um, it was plant thick and then thin. Um, and when people in uh, cities saw people come out and start to thin uh, plantations, which was what they were supposed to do, um, then as now, they completely freaked out, you know. If you want to know what I'm talking about, go into Central Park and start a chainsaw and see how long it takes for someone to find you. <laughs> we have a, a broader question too. This one is what sort of upbringing and early experiences you suppose Olmsted had to have these ideas about parks for everyone? Sorry, Christy, can you say that again? So this is about a broader question about um, Olmsted himself and what sorts of upbringing or early experiences did he have that you think led him to his ideas about parks for everyone? Ethan question. Connecticut Yankee. I mean, what, 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 what was what his early experiences, you know, growing up in Hartford, Connecticut River Valley, New England, very New England, it's about community and it's about the institutions that build community. So it's, it's public parks became one of those vital institutions. And that, by the way, was a big complaint he had about both, both the West and the South was that they didn't have those institutions. And what we mean are schools, museums, um, uh, cultural institution and public parks that are all part of how communities are built and how they're maintained. Uh, and, and his goals for public parks were about human happiness and well-being and about community because he, uh, and throughout, and this is something shared again across the spectrum from Yosemite to Central Park, the idea that these places were necessary for democracy to function because you had to have places in which people came together on common ground and confirmed common values and built a sense of community. Um, and why did, didn't they have them in the, in his, through his travels in the South? Uh, why wasn't there any investment in this commonwealth? Well, because most, cap, most capital, almost all the capital that was available uh, was being reinvested in the expansion of slavery. That's where and, money flowed. Right, and, and if you have you know, more than half of your population enslaved, the last thing you really wanna do is have public institutions that are teaching people to read and, 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 and to build a sense of community. You know, it's a, it's a very destabilizing idea actually. A couple of us also had the, a question about how you collaborated on this book. Did you break up the topics? Did you each of you write different chapters? How did you co-author the story? Rolf and I have been working on this book for at least our entire professional life. We, we've, <laughs> we've known each other a long time and we're good friends. And we have been, the ideas in this book are ideas that we have kicked around for a long time. And for anyone considering co-authorship, I would say that would be a good, situation to be in because um yeah um uh, yeah it's, this is this, this is a conversation that began a long time ago and it's um and in a way it's a it's it's been an opportunity for us to present it to the public uh in a more complete form and and also to the national park service and frankly i think we both hope you can say something about this Ralph, but we both hope that we'll have better luck with the National Park Service and, and, and getting a little more traction with how people are thinking there uh, 
with this book than maybe we've been able to in the past in individual efforts. I think there's a changing, uh, there's a younger generation that's much more uh, interested in um, taking a fresh look and a more contextual look at their history and a more honest appraisal. Mm -hmm. we'll see. You, you've definitely pulled together a lot of fascinating threads that seem disparate at the beginning. So it's fascinating to see how you pulled it together at the end for how the causal effects of one thing went into park design and park um, purchases. Uh, for people that want to purchase your book, where should they look? Well, I would go to your local bookstore and if they don't have it, or they can order it. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, we certainly want to encourage independent bookstores to carry it. Um, um, if you want to go, go online, there are options. Uh, Powell's uh, uh, sells it um, online. Uh, a number of places do. And, you know, All the, the online, online options um, you can get through the Library of American Landscape History website. Um, because that's our publisher. Um, Robin Carson is the executive director. They're an excellent organization that publish books about American landscape history. And all the books are there and you get um, a, a series of links to all the online options for purchasing um, uh, uh, if you go to the LALH website. Wonderful. For each book. Yeah, and they're, they're a, you know, a nonprofit organization that's promoting scholarship and landscape studies. Thank you very much. And we thank the audience that came for this talk today. I hope it's enriched um, your day and your understanding of another California landscape. So thank you so much. Thank you, Christy. And thank Thanks, you everyone Christy. for coming. Good job.